Okay, so I'm going to talk about local theory of one dimensional foliations. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the singularities of one dimensional foliations. Okay, uh, so let us take F, a one-dimensional holomorphic foliation. I'm going to emphasize the, the case of C2, okay? So I'm be in a neighborhood of the origin of C2. Just a few remarks I'm going to make in higher dimensions, some definitions I'm going to do in higher dimensions and linearization in the case of Poincaré domain, but all the rest I'm going to say on C2. Okay, so as far as we have a one-dimensional foliation, we have a holomorphic vector field defining the foliation, and we can assume that the co-dimension of the singular set of this vector field is at least two, okay? Otherwise, we can divide for uh, the common factor that can appear, okay? We know also that we can define in the case of dimension two, we can also define this uh, holomorphic foliation by a one form, okay, such that the codimension of the singular set of this one form is also at least equal to two, okay, but this is in dimension two. But since some of the definitions I'm going to give in higher dimensions, so I will always look for the vector field defining the foliation, okay? Okay, so let us assume that the foliation or the vector field has a singular point at the origin. And in the particular case that we are in a neighborhood of the origin of C2, this singular point must be an isolated singular point of the foliation. <coughs> so we know that x calculated at the origin is equal to zero. Okay, so I'm going to start by, def by defining what the eigenvalues of the foliation is. Okay, so the eigenvalues, they are defined at a singular point. So the eigenvalues of the foliation at the origin are defined as the eigenvalues of the Jacobian of x at 0 and the Jacobian of x at 0, I will just denote by dx at 0. So as far as you are in a neighbor of the CN, we have n eigenvalues. We have just two eigenvalues in the case of C2. And a remark is that the eigenvalues, they are well defined up to a multiplicative constant, okay? Because when we are defining the vector field that gives, describes as the foliation, the vector field is also well defined up to 
a multiplicative function, okay? And if you assume that the codimension of the singular set is at least two, this multi multiplicative function cannot vanish at the origin. So this may change the eigenvalues, but they change by a same constant, okay? So the eigenvalues of f are well defined up to a multiplicative constant since the vector field representing f is well defined up to a multiplicative or up to a non-vanishing let me say and like this a multiplicative function f such that f the origin is different from zero Okay. So in the particular case that we have two eigenvalues, either they are both equal to zero, or if we have, for example, lambda one different from zero, what is well defined is lambda two over lambda one. Okay? So a singularity of F is said to be elementary if F has at least one eigenvalue different from zero. The singular, at the singular point okay and if we have at least one eigenvalue equal to zero we'll say that this elementary singular point is a set lot okay so if an elementary singular point or singularity has at least one eigenvalue equal to zero, we will call it a set of not. So on in C2, we must have one eigenvalue equal to zero, the other non-zero. If we have, if we are in our higher dimension, we can call the codimension of the saddle node to the number of the eigenvalues if equal to zero that we have. Okay, so let us then consider X, the holomorphic vector field defining our foliation F, let the origin be a singular point of the foliation or of the vector field, it doesn't matter, and let us denote by lambda the vector constituted by the eigenvalues Okay, and we say 
back to the eigenvalues. Our resonance, if there exists a number i between 1 to n, and there exists a vector i e1, en, in n and 0. So they are all integer numbers, natural numbers that can eventually be equal to 0, such that I will denote by models of i the sum of these elements greater than or equal to 2, such that the eigenvalue lambda i is the inner product of i with lambdas. So I can write one of the lambda y's as a combination of all the other eigenvalues. Okay? And eventually, we can have a non-vanishing coefficient for lambda y itself. Okay, so in this case, if we have a resonance, okay, so if we, ha we have a relation like this, we'll say that xi ddxi is a resonant term. where by xi will denote the product x1 power i1 times xn power in. Okay? Okay, so let us take x a holomorphic vector field such that no one of its eigenvalues is equal to zero. Okay, so I will say that x is in the Poincaré domain if the origin of C does not belong to the complex whole defined by the eigenvalues. Otherwise, we'll say that x is in the single domain. Okay, so essentially, we take c, we take the eigenvalues, we look to the convex rule of these eigenvalues. In that case, the origin does not belong to it, so the vector field is in the Poincaré domain. In that case, for example, the origin is in the convex rule, so we are in the Ziegel domain. Okay, so in a particular case, 
that we are with a vector field defined on a neighbor of the origin of C2. We have just two eigenvalues. Okay. We'll assume that none of these eigenvalues is equal to zero. <coughs> so to be in the Poincaré domain, is equivalent to say that the quotient of the eigenvalues does not belong to a negative real number. It's, okay, does not belong to R minus. I was written zero, but we are excluding zero eigenvalues. Okay, and also in this particular case, resonance plus being in the Poincaré domain is equivalent to say that we'll have lambda 1 equal to n times lambda 2 or lambda 2 equal to n lambda 1 for some n greater than or equal to 2. Okay. OK, so we are, we are going to start studying elementary singularities, taking account the problem of linearization, OK? And then uh, the general case where the singularity is non-elementary, we'll take care about this, looking to the Seidenberg theorem, so to the reduction of singularities that I will talk about later. OK, so uh, study of elementary singularities. Uh, and to begin with, let me just recall a definition. Let us take x and y holomorphic vector fields defined on a neighbor of Cn of the origin, such that the codimension of the singular sets of both vector fields is at least 2. OK? And let us assume that 0 is a singular point for both x and y. Okay, so one more definition. We will say that x is analytically or if we prefer formally CR, C infinity, conjugated to I, okay? If there exists a holomorphic and respectively formally CR or C infinity diffeomorphism A H with H at zero to be equal to zero such that the derivative of H put like this, y is dh minus 1 times x composed with h. So essentially, I will have h defined from an open set U to an open set V. 
if we consider here the flow of y, okay, and we take h here. Again, this diagram commutes if I consider here the flow of x. Okay, so essentially, I have here the leaves of the foliation. Why? And they are sent by H to the leaves of the foliation uh, X. Okay? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so let me give normal forms for the vector field, thinking on this conjugacy. And I'm going to look to normal forms for elementary. Elementary singularities and I will start with the this is this one the Poincaré theorem that says the following so let X be a holomorphic vector field defined on same neighborhood of the origin of Cn. Uh, such that the codimension of the singular set of X is at least two. And I will assume also that the linear part of f of x is diagonalizable. She, I can even assume that it is already diagonal. Up to consider a linear change of coordinates. Okay, so if x is in the Poincaré domain. Then, uh, uh, and there are no resonances. <laughs> then X is analytically conjugated. To its linear part. So, I'm not going to do the wall proof. I'm just going to, some, to give you some parts of the proof that shows the problem for the general case. Okay? If you want to see all the details, for example, they are all explicit in a lecture, note, lecture notes that I, I have with Julie Rubella in archive okay, in 2011. And uh, so the idea of the proof 
is the following. So first, we should look for a formal solution of the equation of an, uh, that gives us the analytical conjugacy. Okay. In terms of computation, it is easier to use this formulation. Okay, so x here x zero for me is linear part of x. Okay, and then after we find a formal solution, we have to show that this formal solution in fact converges. Okay, so prove that H converges by using some measurement methods. Okay, and I can say by using the Cauchy measurement method. Okay, so it's the first part of the proof that I'm going to present here some calculations. So about one. So let us assume that our vector field X can be written in that form. So I have here the sum from j till n of lambda j x j plus a holomorphic function of order at least two. Okay, so and let me consider the function h from y1 till i n written as y1 plus h y1 y n y n plus y h1 here h n y1 y n and this will be our x1 x n I'm assuming that H is tangent to the identity, okay, since the, uh, I'm assuming that the linear part of X is already diagonal, okay. And uh, we'll try to solve this equation. And we have the following. So. When we try, when we look to the, vec to the initial vector field, we see that x j dot is equal to lambda j x j plus this function phi j x1 x n. From here, we know that x j will coincide y with y j plus h j at y1, yn. Okay, so taking the derivative of the second equation, we get that xj dot is yj dot plus the sum of the der partial derivatives of hj in order to dxk times xk dot uh, y sorry y okay so substituting now this term here and again substituting these j's in terms of y what we get is that lambda j xj, so xj is um, 
yj plus hj of y1, yn, okay, uh, plus fitj at y1 plus I, uh, h1 till in plus hn. So I'll, I will omit here the variables, not to make it too long. And this must be equal to this part. And here in coordinates h, I'm assuming that I'm with the linear vector field. So yj dot will be just lambda j yj, okay, plus the sum from k to n of the partial derivatives of hj with respect to the yk and yk dot is lambda k yk. Okay. So I want a formal solution for this. So let me write these hj's has the sum of h i k y k with the models of k greater than or equal to two. So I'm using this notation to the models of k and to the power of y. Okay. And thus, in this sense, what I get is lambda that lambda j uh, lambda j yj cancels with this lambda j yj here so I get lambda j hj and so I will write hj has the sum of hj k y k okay using this notation plus the function phi j. Here I'm not going to put this notation for h, y, because we want to solve in order to h, j, k. As far as I substitute here, since phi j has order at least two, the terms that appear here in each time is order high, with higher order. So I will keep the notation here. And so this will be equal to the sum from k from 1 to n of the partial derivative of these h k's, okay, but as far as I look to the partial derivatives of these h k's, I have to take the sum of models of k greater than or equal to 2, taking the derivative with respect to y k, the power of y k goes to the front, the power of I, y k goes minus one, but we are multipli multiplying by yk again, so we recover the same power. So what I get here is q k h k, uh, sorry, lambda k h j k y k. Okay, so this is kept here, the power, the kj, the kk goes, to the qk goes to the front, the power of yk is minus one, but we recover here, as I said. Okay, so we have that the models for the sum for models of key greater than or equal to two of 
lambda j minus this sum with respect to k that corresponds to the inner product of k with the vector of vector fields times h a k y k must coincide with minus phi j of y1 plus h1 till yn plus hn. I can put this in power series, okay? And I have to compare the coefficients. But as far as I try to solve, for example, those values of h, j, k, where models of k is equal to 2. Here, they are not, they do not appear on powers of k with models equal to 2 because phi j has already higher order than 1. Okay? So what I can say here is that I can always solve this in order to h, j, k whenever this value here is different from 0. Okay, so we have formal solution whenever lambda j does not coincide with the inner product of Q with lambda for every j that you consider and for every Q with models of Q, Q in N, 0, N, with models of Q at least 2. I mean, if we don't have resonances, okay? So, Okay, so in the conditions of the Poincaré theorem, we are assuming that we don't have resonances, so we can find a formal solution for, the, for this equation. So about the second point, as I said, we'll use the Cauchy measurement methods and what is important for us in the particular case of the Poincaré domain is the following. So, for the second part, since we have no resonances, And since we are assuming that we are in the Poincaré domain, we have that these elements that we must have to divide to calculate H, G, K, they are bounded from below by a strictly positive constant that does not depend neither on Y, neither on K. Okay, Okay. so in this case we apply then the Cauchy measurement methods and this part I'm not going to do the calculations either to prove that it follows. Okay? Okay, so I stated this result for dimension n. Now I'm going to pass to dimension 2. Okay? Sorry, the. Yes. The, the formal solution exists, yeah. 
Whenever you don't have resonances, it works. Okay? So what is the problem, for example, but, but, but I will say later. I will say later. Uh, about the, the Siegel domain. Okay, so from now on, X is defined on a neighborhood of the origin of C2. Okay, so what happens if we have resonances? I, I can eventually, but I'm going to state this and I will then leave you an exercise. So, assume now that we are still in the Poincaré domain, but we have resonances, okay? So, since uh, it is no more written here, okay? Since we are in dimension 2, to have resonances, I have one eigenvalues, and the other one is n times the first one for uh, integer n greater than or equal to 2. Okay, so I can assume that the vector field takes on the form lambda 1x plus higher order terms, ddx plus lambda 2y plus higher order terms, ddy. I'm going to assume that it is the second eigenvalue, that it is a multiple of the first one, where n is an integer number with n at least 2. So this is Poincaré domain plus resonances. It's the only condition in dimension 2. Then we have that x is analytically conjugated not to its linear part, but to the vector field y given by lambda 1 x plus a y n d d x plus lambda 2 y d d y, where a is a number on c. That can be zero, okay? So there are some particular cases that in fact it is analytically conjugated to its linear part, but not necessarily in all cases. Okay? If we look to this part appearing here, that we cannot eliminate in all of situations, if you remark this corresponds to a resonant monomial. So I mean when you are trying to solve the formal solution for the conjugation with linear part, this is the element for which this component is equal to zero, so we cannot necessarily uh, calculate h of j, k. So the problem is if the corresponding coefficient on the right hand side is non-zero. Okay? So this here may eventually not disappear. Okay? Uh, you can try to do the proof in this case. You can use already this normal form. If you want to try to use these normal forms in general, what you should try to do is, okay, when I write here these y's, I will say that uh, yj dot will be lambda j ya plus a function pj, and we try to solve and to see which, which uh, pj's we can have. Okay. So an exercise that I can also left here so that you can do is the following. I'm assuming here 
that the linear part of the vector fields are diagonalizable. Okay, but in fact, if they are not diagonalizable, it is also conjugated to its linear part in the case of the Poincaré domain without resonances. Okay, so if lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 and we have the linear part of x as 1x plus y or constant times, a non-zero non constant times y. So there still exists analytical conjugation between x and its linear part x is zero. Okay? So note that if the eigenvalues are equal to each other, we don't have resonances, okay? Since we are assuming that they are all non-zero. Okay. So let me pass now to the Siegel domain. And say what happens in this case. So since we are in dimension 2, I'm assuming that the quotient of these eigenvalues is a negative real number. Okay. And the problem now to try to solve this equation is the following. We can have resonances. Okay, for example, if the, this is a rational number, we have resonances. But if we ha this quotient is an irrational negative number, although we have no resonances, and which means that we can formally solve this equation, and we have formal conjugation to its linear part, the problem is that the elements that we have to divide by to calculate age G key, they can be arbitrarily small, okay? So in terms of trying to prove the convergency, okay, we have problems to, to prove this, okay? So there are some conditions where we can assure that, in fact, it converges like Bruner conditions and so on, but in general, it is much more difficult. Okay, so in this case, the uh, the element, even if we have non-resonances and we have formal conjugacy to its linear part, we may have that H is not analytic. And the problem is that these elements lambda J minus Q lambda can be arbitrarily small. Okay, and this is the so-called problem of small divisor or the denominators, I don't know how to say exactly in English, okay? Okay, so it can be linearizable in same condi under some conditions, like run conditions, as I said, 
but we don't have a linearization in general. However, we can prove the following. So I think I will use Okay, assume then x is lambda 1 x plus higher order terms ddx plus lambda 2y plus higher order terms ddy. Assume that the eigenvalues are both non zero, their quotient is a negative real number, so we are in the Siegel domain. What we can prove in that is that x is analytically conjugated to a vector field taking on this form y is x times lambda 1 plus y times a function on x and y plus y lambda 2 plus x a function on x and y, where a and b are holomorphic functions vanishing at the origin. Okay. So a remark that I can make here is that if I look to the normal form that I get, x equal to 0 and y equal to 0, they are invariant by the vector field y. Okay, uh, so we should say that they are separatrices for y or for the foliation associated to y. Okay, so what a separatrix is? So by definition, a separatrix is a germ of an analytic curve that passes through the singular point and it is invariant by the foliation or by the corresponding vector field. Okay, so it is a germ of analytic curve that is invariant by y and passes through the singular point. Okay. So, in terms of elementary singularities, it is missing the case of saddle nodes. Well, there are a lot of things to say about the singularities, even in the case of the saddle node, I'm just going to mention uh, some particular results. Okay, so let us consider now the saddle node. So we have 
one eigenvalue different from zero, I can assume that it is lambda one. The other one is equal to zero. Okay, and in fact, since it is the eigenvalues are defined up to a multiplicative constant, we can assume that lambda one is equal to one. Okay, to simplify. So we have the following result. Let x be a saddle node. as above. Okay, so here we can say that there exists an integer number greater than or equal to one. There exists also a lambda, a constant lambda c, such that x is analytically equivalent to the vector field y given by x times 1 plus lambda y p plus y times a function, a holomorphic function r dx plus y power p plus 1 d dy. Okay. So where R is a holomorphic function with order greater than or equal to P plus one at the origin. So I'm not going to prove this theorem. We can start by eliminating some, some, non some non resonant terms that appear here. Then we can make some calculations. We can eliminate, eliminate some others, okay? And we can prove the convergence in any case. But I will keep with this form. What I want to say is that if we try to look to the formal conjugacy, I can say that the vector field y in the Dulac theorem okay, is formally conjugate Uh, formally conjugated to the vector field Z given by X one plus lambda Y P D D X plus Y P plus one D D Y. Okay, so two remarks. One is on the Poincaré du Lac theorem. <laughs> Nobody asked what I mean by analytically equivalent. I have defined analytically, analytically conjugated. So analytically equivalent simply means that this vector field X does not has to be necessarily analytically conjugated to this one but it is analytically conjugated to a holomorphic function times this one. Okay, so I have divided by the common factor that can appear there. Okay? In terms of this theorem here, I can see that Z has two separatrices. Namely, in these local coordinates, it corresponds to x equal to 0 and to y equal to 0, okay? However, 
the initial vector field x or the vector field y, since they are analytically equivalent to what happens to one happens to other in terms of separatrices, x has a separatrice has for sure one separatrix, but we don't know if they have a second separatrix, a se second separatrix. So it cannot have a second separatrix. Why? Uh, cannot. It may have, no, it may have, but it may not have. Okay. Uh, so, it may not have a second separatrix. Thanks. <laughs> Sometimes we don't express very well. Okay, so why this happens? What is the name separatrix coming from? Why separatrix? What is separatrix? Well, if you are in the real case, it makes separate. In the complex case, it is different. But uh, maybe because of that, I don't know. <laughs> it comes from the real sense. It comes from the separate regions. You separate two regions. If you are an R2. OK, so. The separatrix that exists in the saddle node, in the initial saddle node, corresponds to y equal to 0. Okay? But here, for example, I see that I cannot put x in evidence. Here, I could. Okay? But the image by x equal to 0 from this formal conjugacy h to here can make that we have a formal separatrix that it is not an analytic, in fact, okay? So it may happen that I only have one separatrix. Okay, now, This separatrix y equal to zero is called in general strong separatrix in the formal separatrix is called weak separatrix. Okay, so I have talked about the elementary singularities. So what about the other singularities? So in that case, we'll consider reduction of singularities. So let me recall what blow up is. Uh, we have, this is one of the tools that we have to apply, or the tools that I have to apply. So, blow up. So, the blow up of C2 at the origin, okay, is a complex Manifold C to tilde, okay, obtained by identifying 
two copies of C2 in the following way. So in one copy, I have coordinates x, t. We'll identify with s, y if we have the following relations. s is 1 over t and y is tx, where t and s are both different from 0. So the exceptional divisor of C to tilde is the sum manifold E, okay, defined. on the coordinates x t by x equal to zero and by y equal to zero in the other coordinates s y. Okay, so in fact the exceptional divisor E it is isomorphic to CP1. Okay, so what happens, I will always have here a projection from C2 tilde to C2, okay, that it is given in coordinates xt as xtx, the projection on S y that it corresponds to s y y okay so this is called the blow up map and we have that the divisor e corresponds to the pre image of the origin by the blow up map, we have that the restriction of P to C to tilde minus the exceptional divisor on C2 minus the origin is a holomorphic diffeomorphism. And we have also that pre that pi is a proper map. Okay, so the pre-image of compact sets is a compact set. Okay. In fact, I can also see CP2, the blow-up of CP2 at the origin as a line bundle over CP1. Okay, simply, I think on the origin, I have the straight lines passing through the origin, I blow up, I get the pre-image of the origin corresponding to the exceptional divisor and these straight lines are lines passing through these points on CP1. Okay, so the blow up of affiliation of 
or of a vector field. It is also well defined. Okay, so the blow up of a vector field or of a foliation can be defined in a natural way. So let us assume that x is given by a function d dx plus another function d dy. Let me assume that the order of x is k, which means that the function a, f, in terms of power series, is an homogeneous component f k plus f k plus 1 plus and so on. g is g k plus g k 1 plus and so on. So at least one uh, between fk and gk is non-zero. Okay. And we can define the blow up of the vector field as simply the pullback of x by pi. Okay. So for example, in coordinates xt, if I take this pullback, what do we get? So I take the pullback of x, this is the derivative of pi minus 1. Okay, let me recall that here I should take on this, okay, to have holomorphic diffeomorphism uh, composed with x uh, multiplied by x composed with pi and if we make the calculations we get the following we get xk times fk at 1 t plus x times a function that depends after that on the other components of f, big F, plus x k minus 1 times and now it appears the same component as before coming from this product so f uh, sorry, minus t f k 1 t minus x t times this function f as before plus g k 1 t plus x small g on x t d t. And with these expressions, we can see that we have different behaviors nearby the exceptional divisor according to the first component of the vector field X. I mean the following. So nearby the exceptional divisor, the behavior depends on gk 1 t minus t f k 1 t. Okay, so what happens? So imagine that this value here, this function here on t is not identically zero. Okay, so what I see there, so the part depending only on t is not identically zero. We can put x k minus 1 in evidence. We omit it 
and x equal to 0, it will be invariant by the vector field, so then by the foliation. So dividing by x k plus 1, I can see that the exceptional divisor that corresponds to x equal to 0 is invariant by the pullback of y or the pullback of the foliation. Okay? But if this function here vanishes identically, okay, so this does not appear, the terms only in t on the second component. So I can put another x in evidence. I get xk. We put xk in evidence. We omit there. And in component ddx, I see fk. 1t and fk 1t cannot vanish identically. Why? Because if fk 1t vanishes identically, gk 1t will vanish identically because of this and x is not of order k. Okay? So since f1 fk 1t cannot vanish identically in this case, Okay, uh, we have that the exceptional divisor is not invariant by the pullback of x or the pullback of the foliations. Okay, so what happens here is the following. I have here my exceptional divisor E. It is not invariant, I mean that my leaves will be generically transverse to the foliations. I may have tangencies, but will be generically transverse. Okay? So, in this case, the divisor will be called uh, the critical divisor. Okay, so critical divisor <coughs> by definition, okay? And what we can also say is the following. So, uh, let me put here case 1, case 2. In case 2, leaves of the pullback of y that is defined the pullback of the foliation are transverse to me in general okay we can take the projection of these leaves It's not their projection. So their projection passes through the origin. And since P is proper, they are analytic curves, okay? So they are, in fact, separatrices. Through the origin. OK, so they are analytic curves. OK, so whenever we have a component of the divisor that it is not invariant by the foliation, in the projection we immediately have an infinite number of separatrices. OK? So the condition that gk1t minus t 
fk 1t to be identically zero is equivalent to say that the first non-zero homogeneous component of x is a multiple of the radial vector field. Okay, so we can easily check if the divisor will be invariant or not. Okay, just an example here. I'm going to consider not the, multi the radial vector field, but x to the x plus n y to the y. I can assume that n is an integer at least greater than 2. Okay. Uh, just to make something where the uh, one forms, as I said in dimension 2, the one dimensional affiliation can be defined by vector fields or by one forms. So here, the one form defining the affiliation is the one form n y dx minus x dy and I can take the blow up of uh, the foliation also thinking on the one forms so the foliation is given by n y dx minus x dy equal to zero okay so taking the blow up, I simply have to substitute in coordinates xt, I will substitute y by xt. Okay, so I have here ny nxt dx plus x dy, I will substitute by x dt plus t dx. This must be equal to zero. Okay, here I can rearrange this. I can also put x in evidence and rearranging it, I will arrive to n minus one t dx minus x dt equal to zero. So if I return to the vector fields, just to compare the initial one, I have that x tilt is x ddx plus n minus 1 t ddt. So here the eigenvalues were 1n, now they are 1n minus 1. Okay, if I repeat this procedure, <coughs> what will I get? I can take again the blow up. I will obtain the vector field x to the x plus n minus 2 uh, u ddu if I change to another coordinate. And I will arrive in a certain moment that I have x ddx plus z ddz. I have, in fact, the radial vector field. So here I will have the divisor. The leaves are transverse. I ha and I have a uh, divisor that it is not invariant. OK, I made some blow ups. So I have other irreducible components of the total divisor. But here, this one is not invariant. OK, so. We have Seidenberg theorem. And that says the following. Let X be a holomorphic vector field defined 
on an open, open neighborhood of the origin of C2. Okay? The origin is a singular point of the vector field. Okay, I'm assuming, still assuming that the singular set of X is at least two to define the defoliation. Then there exists a finite sequence of blow-ups uh, along with transformed foliations so I will put here if is the foliation F0 I have a blow-up P1 I get a foliation F1 I still get more blow-ups till a blow-up where the foliation FK has only elementary singular points. Okay, and the centers of this foliation, the, uh, sorry, the centers of the blow-ups are always singular points of the foliation. Okay. In fact, we can assume a little bit more. We can assume that these elementary singular points, we can assume also that lambda 1 over lambda 2 are not resonant terms in the Poincaré domain. Okay? These resonant terms in the Poincaré domain, we can eliminate them. Okay, so... To finish the, the course, I had here two things. I had an example. I had also uh, a result. I'm going, I think I'm going to present the results. Eventually, I can make very quickly the example. So the result here is Kamash Sad result. <coughs> that says the following let x be a holomorphic vector field <coughs> defined on an open set of C2 being the origin there the origin is a, an isolated singularity of x which means that singular set of, of um, x as codimension at least 2, then we have that there exists a separatrix passing through the origin. <coughs> okay. So, this result here, to be proved, they use the, the singularization, the Seidenberg the singularization, and they have to control the singular points that may appear, okay? Um, uh, they have to control, there are some index theorems and so on, then they have to control, and to ensure that after a finite number of blow-ups, they arrive to some singular point that it is not a corner, it is not an intersection of uh, two, two components of the exceptional divisor, and such that the singular point, um, the, this singular point has one separatrix that is transverse to the exceptional divisor. 
okay? So the example that I had here for the Seidenberg theorem, uh, I had here all the calculations, but I can just give you the picture so that you can see both things. So the example, it was take the foliation defined by the one form d x3 minus y2 equal to zero. Okay, so this corresponds to the vector field 2i d d x plus 3x square d d y. This is a nilpotent vector field, the linear part is nilpotent. It has zero eigenvalues, okay? So we have from Seidenberg a reduction of the singularities. And how does it work? So we can start with the origin. We can blow up the origin. We obtain a component of the exceptional divisor. If you, ca if you make the computations like I made here, we can you can check all of this. Note that here I made in coordinates x, t. You have to c calculate also in coordinates s, y, because in s, y, the origin of s, y uh, is the infinity of x, t. So you can have also singular points there. So you have to check all of this. Okay, so taking the blow up here, I have just one singular point, okay? <clears throat> you can blow up again. You have here just one singular point again, but it corresponds to the intersection of two divisors, okay? So for example, here, since this is derivative of a function equal to zero, you know that this function here is the first integral for the foliation. I mean, this function is constant along each leaf. So I know that I have separat a separatrix that corresponds to x3 minus x squared equal to zero. So it is a cusp here. And how I will see there. So this cusp, when I take the first blow up, it is a tangent curve here. Okay. Here I will look for the transformation. This apparatrix is uh, transverse to these exceptional divisors, and in a final, in a final blow up, this singular point here is now a divisor. The blow up it is a divisor, uh, and I have three curves intersecting it in different points. Two of them correspond to two of the previous divisors, and the third one corresponds to the separatrix here, okay? And here, all the singular points, all the three singular points, they have non-zero eigenvalues, okay? So this is an example. <coughs> And in fact, what they made in the proof is, okay, but they are considering uh, these blow-ups and at a certain time, they know exactly that there exists here a singular point that has a separatrix that is transverse to the exceptional divisors. And it is not intersection of two divisors. So projecting, it is in fact a separatrix. Here, if I forget this curve, in red, in these singular points, I know that I have two separatrices, but if I project, it reduces just to the origin. So I don't, I couldn't see the separatrix. Okay, that's all. <clears throat>